Guam is an unincorporated but organized territory of the United States in the Western Pacific. Those born here are considered U.S. citizens, and all U.S. constitutional provisions apply here, including land ownership, but excluding the right to vote for president. The land was settled 4,000 years ago by the Chamorro people. Spain colonized the island not long after Ferdinand Magellan arrived in 1521. But in 1898, Spain ceded Guam to the U.S., it becoming one of the first U.S. colonies or territories. On December 8, 1941, hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan invaded and captured Guam from the United States. The Japanese forced the Guamanians into hard labor, torturing and raping and killing many of them. American troops liberated the island, recapturing it three years later on July 22, 1944. This here is our Santa Maria Carmelin statue. She is our patron saint. She is the protector of our island. Catholicism runs deep in Guam. Over 95% of the population is Catholic. One of their most important public holidays is a Catholic feast day, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which coincidentally is intertwined with much of their history. On December 8th, we have the Immaculate Feast of Mary, but that's also when we were celebrating and in prayer that we actually got attacked by Pearl Harbor. The Japanese came over and over the international date line. And so that was also on December 8th, 1941. But one of the unique things about it is every December 8th, it's what we call a public holiday. One year, one of our governors decided that he would take that public holiday away. And as it turned out, that's when our super typhoon Poksanwa hit and devastated our island. Therefore, our Manamkos, our elders, had told him that you, dis you disrespected the Tautamona spirits and therefore to place it back into a holiday, which has been ever since. And what is Tautamona? Our Tautamona, Tautam means people. So we say the, the people, the Tautamona is our spirits. It's our ancestors. Because we believe on this island, there's always Tautamona spirits. If we have children, we try to tell them not to make noise after sunset. Don't disrespect the Tautamona. Even if you're going into an ancient ground, we ask permission. We will do a little prayer. Guelo singuela dispensa zupo fabot, asking for the permission. And then we also, you know, Suzu Smaasi, thank you for allowing us to be on this ground. We've actually had places where, and I even had witness to where if you disrespected the spirit, you either got a bruise or a pinch and or a sickness that you couldn't explain. And it wasn't until you went back to where you offended the spirit that you actually go back and ask forgiveness and then the illness goes away mysteriously. Now, and we hiked to the Two Lovers Cave, right? right? And we asked permission. We asked permission to go in the cave, but my other half, he didn't tell me he, he cut one. He cut a silent one. And so for a whole week, he was complaining of stomach problems. He had pains and he had blood in his stool. And we couldn't explain it. It was nothing different that we ate. And then I said, what did you do? And he goes, well, I farted in Two Lovers Cave. And I said, no, did you ask forgiveness? He goes, no. So believe it or not, I had to go and arrange with the Arteros that we could have access to their private beach. And then we had to hike down to the cave. And then we actually had to go in and ask forgiveness, and which he did. And then as soon as that happened, everything went away. Just mysteriously, the Tautamona spirits had forgiven him and his illness was gone. Marte is referring to the sacred site of the two lovers, an ancient Chamorro legend. Its climax happened here on this high cliff above Tuman Bay. There was once a young, beautiful, upper-class woman of mixed Spanish and Chamorro descent. Without her consent, her parents set up an arranged marriage for her to a Spanish captain. The girl was unhappy with the plan and fled from home to the cliffs to stare at the sea in starlit night. There she met a young, strong man from a poor Chamorro family, who, like her, wondered at the stars above. The two fell in love and promised to meet again. The girl went home to tell her parents. Her father was outraged and demanded she marry the Spanish captain immediately. The girl fled again at sundown and met her Chamorro lover at the same high point along the shore. Her father, the captain, and all his Spanish soldiers pursued the lovers and trapped them on the cliff. 
With no way of escape, the lovers tied their long black hair together into a single knot, kissed, and jumped from the steep cliff into the waters below. So this is the area where the two lovers had jumped off to their death. So if you go out, you'll see that 300, uh, uh, 340 feet deep down to, the, down to uh, the ocean level. When you look here, here at the lover's point, you look down to the right here, you'll see the face of a female woman with the silhouette of her hair going back. That rock right there. So that's a female's face with her hair going back. Is this, do you like pray that you find a boyfriend or something here or? <laughs> Actually, she wanted to tie her hair with someone. What does that mean, tie her hair? So basically the hair tie from what we were talking about earlier like was that, uh, for, yeah, the forbidden love, they, the, because they loved each other so much that uh, the Chamorro men and the Chamorro women had long hair. So because of that, and they, they decided to jump together, they decided to tie their hair so that they both would do it yeah. at the same time. And then, you know, that ended their love and they'd still be bonded by the tying of the hair. We are now here at the Nimitz Hill, uh, War in the Pacific, overlooks the Assin Beach. That is where the Americans came in and had worked their way in through Guam, through this mountain site, and started clearing out all the Japanese that were on island. So this is how they came in through the island and started their liberation of the island of Guam. Yes, there was uh, Japanese uh, the soldiers that were all over the jungles that were shooting back at them to try and keep them out. But the guns were located like at the PD guns. They had the PD guns where they had some guns there. They had some guns located over the, the APRA harbor area. So those were the sites that where the guns were located to shoot against anyone coming in. But the Americans were smart enough that they, they didn't have any guns in this area in which they were able to come in. So this place was, you know, the Japanese knew it as the Banzai Charges. So a lot of the, the, the Japanese counteracted, uh, attacked the Americans coming up this hill here, the valley here. So they were throwing mortars and stuff like that back to them just to keep them away from, from coming and invading the island of Guam. Or not invading, but having to uh, take over the island itself. So this is a, a photo of the area. This is the South Pacific Memorial, erected here by Japanese citizens, citizens residents of Guam, after, the, after World War II. In 1944, American troops landed in the south and pushed the Japanese forces to the north. This area was the Japanese command's last stronghold. When the Japanese realized the American troops had taken Guam, they retreated to this hill with many Chamorro prisoners. They first forced the Chamorros to dig caves and then beheaded them all before taking their own lives inside the caves. You're Chamorro, is that right? That's correct. And how do you feel about the Japanese, you know, with that history? Modern day Japanese? Well, I, do you have forgiveness or do you hold resentment? Well, growing up, my parents never talked about the war. They, my father was a prisoner of war. My father came out of that war being only 68 pounds because he was a prisoner of war and he was one of the prisoners that dug the holes in, in Hagatnya. There are several holes, several caves that were dug there and they were more like a labyrinth. He went in and out of these holes in different directions and that was where my father was imprisoned in that area. So, but I didn't know that. I was not born at that time. My oldest brother had just shared that information with us and it was only then that I really felt a little bit uneasy with them. But before that, this island was just, they just wanted peace. They were just happy to be alive. Uh, they, they just believed that it's over, it was, it's, a, it's war, it was war, and we just are happy to be alive and move on. That was the mentality of the Chamorros when I was growing up. So as far as being oppressed, we, the, the Chamorros were forced to speak Japanese. Prior to that, they were forced to speak Ch uh, Spanish, uh, I'm sorry, English. Bef before that, they were forced to speak Ch 
uh, Spanish. So the Chamorros are multilingual. I know my parents spoke all different languages only because all that was imposed on them over the years. So we kind of adapted to that kind of a, a mindset that imposition is a part of life, it seems like, for the Chamorros. So therefore, they became very peace, peace loving and Okay, well, they, yeah, they, they did this to us, but we survived, we're still here. So after World War II, I, and looking back, Chamorros had all kinds of kids after World War II because they had gone through this period with the Spanish back in, in the 16, 1700s where they were almost eradicated. There were only 3,000 Chamorros left. So after the Japanese left, the Chamorros had tons of kids. Some of them had 10, 12 kids so that they could rebuild the population. And they were just happy to be able to do that. So the Japanese come here to give gift offerings to, to the, the men who the, the killed because, themselves? Or, yes, yes. Hmm. And a lot of these Japanese that come to Guam have relatives that, that, were, that fought in this war that have never returned to Guam. So they're, they come here hoping that this is the last place that their relative was. That goes back to way before Nazism. It's a Buddhist symbol that has nothing to do with the swastika. It looks like a button. Yeah, it does. But it's yeah, not. It's just... Yeah, because Buddhism predates Nazism by thousands of years. <laughs> Julie then took us to the far north, driving alongside the U.S. Anderson Air Force Base which, as shown in blue, occupies a large part of the island. It's known as the U.S. military supermarket because of the massive amounts of weaponry here. North Korea's Kim Jong-un had just threatened to strike Guam. Because of this, there were hundreds of reporters here from around the world and street demonstrations supporting simultaneously both peace and support for the U.S. military. Uh, Anderson Air Force Base is where there's a hot, a hot concentration of bombers, starting with the B-52s, onto current, our current bombers, stealth bombers. Uh, we constantly see jets flying overhead. Uh, right now it's kind of a quiet, a quiet time, and it seemed to have quieted down uh, after the Northern Korean threat. And it's because they're out there. The jets are out there. They're out flying in different locations now, but here on Guam, you would see them on a daily basis. If we were to get um, attacked by a missile, we have missiles that are going to be shot in the, air, in the air to intercept those missiles. As far as atomic bombs, I'm pretty sure that those bombers probably will be loaded with those nuclear bombs. Yes, I feel safe. Of course, one bomb is going to blow all of us up, and if, if that should happen, then what can we do? There's nothing we can do. But I feel safe for the fact that we have them available to us at our disposal, so to speak. Not with the military here, we can. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the interception will happen once a missile gets launched from North Korea. That that intercept, intercepting missile will shoot it out of the air before it hits Guam. So that's where my confidence is. No, my dad was a Marine mm -hmm. in World War II in the Pacific. Okay. And he basically grew up dirt poor in Maryland. So probably when he entered the Marines, he'd probably never, up to before then, he'd probably never been more than 20 miles away from his farmhouse in Maryland. We have actually the museum houses two separate wings. Oh, okay. Uh, one um, dedicated to the Japanese and, you know, one dedicated to the Americans. All right. Those two. So we can go ahead and... Oh, great. We have our vehicles here. We have pictures on the walls. And they first actually took over the island. This is the Japanese, I guess, Japanese naval troops in front of the marine barracks that was located in Sumai. We also have, these are prisoners of war, Japanese prison camps. And then we have the war trials, Japanese war trials. They were held up at Nick Tams. And then these are some of the US items, uh, you know, like um, things that were found in the jungle on and around the, the island of Guam. And we have the M1 Garand. 
this photo here is actually a, um, to celebrate our first Liberation Day. This is Plaza de España in the background. And then Father Duenas. Father Duenas was um, said to be very outspoken against the Japanese. So they had executed him and a few local men. So the possession you see here was actually the locals that had gone and taken his body and he is now interred in our St. Joseph's Church in Inarahan. When, when, when I was growing up in this village here, you know, we take turns during, before mass, like half an hour before mass, we have to, somebody has to be assigned to climb up to that tower up there and ring the bell three times before the mass started. Yeah. Uh, we're walking up to the altar where Father Drenz was buried underneath. Right there is where Father Drenz was buried. Actually, Father Drenz was the priest of Inorahan, and he was uh, accused of, uh, you know, by the Japanese that uh, he's helping one of the American that uh, named Tweet here on the island. And he was accused that uh, he's helping him, you know, to escape from the Japanese. You know. So uh, he was taken to, to uh, Tai Mangilo area where Father Drenis is, and he was beheaded right there. So after the war, they took his body, they excavated his body and reburied right in this altar here. I talk about, you know, the wood that they use this is made from the hardest wood you could find here on the island. They call it ephid wood. But how come there's so many big holes on the floor? Do you think it's uh, caused by a bark or termites or anything like that? No. It happened on December 8, 1941. Japan invaded the island. Within two days, they overran the entire island. And it happened that the fighter plane from Japan was shooting all the houses in this village, and lucky nobody was killed. The people were so afraid they go into hiding. And look at this, all this uh, machine gun uh, riddle on the floor. So, again, the, the area is steeped in history. What all along the river you have what they call Lati sites, the ancient villages that feed up all the way to the lake that supplies the river with its fresh water, uh, Fena Lake. Um, and so most of the people prior to the arrival of the Spanish were situated in this area. There, there were other villages around the island along the shores, but you had a lot of people here, again, primarily because fresh water, easy access to it. Fast forward to World War II. And December 7, 1941, they're bombing Pearl Harbor. Well, simultaneously, December 8, they're bombing Guam. And then we become the only possession of the United States that were, was occupied for, by Japan for uh, three years, 1941 to 1944. Which leads to the story of the guy that stayed out here for 28 years, uh, Soichi Okoye. Uh, two of his comrades and he decided that instead of surrendering, they stay out there. Two of the comrades die during the course of their stay. But in 1972, 28 years after the end of the war, two gentlemen here that own land and, and farm and fish up there found Sergeant Yokoi checking their fish traps. So they brought him and took him to this building. This building used to be an old store called Surfside. Did the first interrogation in here and found out he was, he was a a uh, Japanese straggler, right, 28 years, and uh, ultimately he was repatriated to Japan. Uh, they, they said that he was a national hero, but his desire, yeah. you, you ready? Yeah. His desire was to meet with the emperor of Japan to apologize for not serving his country well. Uh, because you're not supposed to surrender, right? Come on, let's go on the boat. Yeah, the, the National Museum for Guam was a project really started by uh, Governor Felix Camacho and uh, at the time we talked about leaving a legacy that would transcend all our generations and tell the story of the evolution of our people. So he appointed me chairman of the Museum Task Force. I became 
chairman of the, of the Museum Foundation and worked with the entire community to be able to first choose a design and then ultimately determine how to fund building that facility. Talk about $27 million and uh, the, the bulk of that funding came from the Tourist Attraction Fund. But a lot of the funding also came through donations from our community because it was a place that they really wanted to be able to tell the story of the evolution of our people here. Half a day, my name is Pilar Laguanya. I'm with the Guam Visitors Bureau, Director of Global Marketing. We boast over 1.5 million visitors, and I have to say, a majority of them comes from our Asian region. We have not seen any decline in our visitor arrivals. In fact, we have more South Koreans visiting our shores today than any place in the United States of America. And we also have many, many tourists from our beautiful neighboring countries of Japan, Taiwan, from the Philippines, from China, from even Russia. This is the playground for our Asian visitors. They come here to rest and relax and enjoy the beautiful Vista view. And why do those 1.5 million visitors come here? <laughs> and still today, do you know my South Korean arrivals have That's boosted in yeah. the last week from mm -hmm. South Korea? So while the world thinks we're losing business, our Asian, Asian visitor <laughs> arrivals are boosting because we are a very safe destination. And uh, what do you think about the, the threat of thermonuclear war? Does that bother you at all? Or? Well, you know, that is um, a very concerning uh, issue for the entire world. This is not an isolated uh, concern that we would have. It would be the entire world. We never want to see that day come. We are an island of peace and love, and in fact, we are celebrating the year of love here on Guam. So what the world needs now is love, sweet love.